Hello and welcome to ESMAR Conf 2022 and our last special session for today, Quantitative Synthesis with a Bayesian Lens. As always, this session is being live streamed to YouTube and individual presentations have been pre-recorded and published there as well. Subtitles have been verified and can be auto-translated from those individual talks and automatic subtitles will be available shortly for the live stream. If you have any questions for our presenters, each presenter has an individual tweet on our Twitter feed, which is at ES Hackathon. Uh, we will keep an eye on questions and endeavor to answer them at the end of the presentations. We would like to draw your attention to our code of conduct, which is available on our website at esmarconf.github.iu. Uh, our first speaker today is František Bartosz from the University of Amsterdam, and we'll pass it over to František. is Frenchik Bartosz. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Amsterdam, and I would like to tell you about troubles based meta analysis, a way of combining multiple methods of publication based adjustment and the Roma R package that implements the methodology. First, I will tell you about, a, about an example that compares research application reports and meta analysis, and I will use it to highlight the problems and challenges of adjusting for publication bias. Then I will tell you a bit more about different ways of adjusting for publication bias, how we can combine them with Bayesian model averaging. And lastly, I will tell you more about the package implementation and functionalities. So the example, Quarman and colleagues in 2020 published a paper that looked at 15 different meta analysis and a register application report that tried to replicate the main, uh, main study of, from each of the analysis. And under some other assumptions, you would expect that the research application report should provide the best possible estimate of the true effect size and that the meta analytic estimates of the original studies should converge to it. Uh, the original meta analysis were of different sizes and they were from 15 to around 300 studies. And uh, if you look at the original effect size estimates based on the published studies, you can see a wide variety of effects. And uh, since this is a top cloud publication bias, Unsurprisingly, you see that the estimates from registered replication reports were much smaller than the original effect size estimate based on meta analysis. So, this large discrepancy is uh, by many attributed to publication bias. And uh, one way that you can use this example is to see how well would uh, different publication bias adjusted met methods adjust for the publication bias and provide estimates closer to the research replication report estimates. So publication bias adjustment is a topic that has been here for many decades, and there have been different methods implemented and developed that try, uh, try to adjust for it. I like to differentiate them in two different camps. One camp are methods that adjust for relationship between standard errors and effect sizes, for example, trim film, fat piece, or indigenous king. And the second groups are selection modes of p-values that uh, try to adjust for publication bias operating on p-values. For example, 3 and 4 PSM, A1, AK2, P curve, P uniform. So I will just go to the something about PET-PIECE and 3 PSM. So PET-PIECE is a conditional meta regression estimator that tries to adjust for relation effect size and standard errors or standard error squares. And uh, the idea is if there is no relationship between effect size and standard errors in, uh, that happens when there's no publication selection bias, then if you fit a meta regression estimator, the intercept should correspond the true effect size. However, if there is a publication best selection, then you see a, a higher number of so small studies with large standard errors and over some effect size estimate, and then fitting either a bad model or piece model should provide a much better effect size estimate. The selection models on the other hand extend the traditional random effect or mixed uh, or fixed effect mathematic model between parameter mu, the heterogeneous parameter tau, and publication best weights omega. Here, for example, we use a step weight function that specifies different uh, publication bias probabilities for different p-value intervals. Here, we can fix uh, the relative publication probability of significant studies to one, and we can estimate the relative publication probabilities of the marginal significant studies or non-significant studies. As a result, you obtain a different likelihood function. So the f would be the unweighted likelihood function, while the fw is the weight likelihood function that takes the different publication probabilities at different p-value intervals into account. Uh, why this uh, approach is interesting? Well, if you look at the 
one million published uh, Z statistic uh, on Medline, you can see a very similar shape that shows two very uh, large discontinuities, maybe accidentally at the alpha 0.05. So if you use those two uh, very popular methods, and uh, in the example of Quaran, we can see the original effects estimate in red, the research replication report estimates in blue, and then the black circles that are pet piece and black triangles that are 3PSM. And in some cases, all of them will provide the same estimate. In some cases, 3PSM is better than pet piece. And in other cases, pet piece is better than 3PSM. The problem is, a priori, it's hard to tell which of the estimates is better. So the question is, how should you base your inference, especially if the methods disagree on the conclusions? So we argue that you shouldn't show, or you shouldn't base the inference on a single model. Instead, you should use surplus Bayesian meta analysis and Bayesian model averaging to base the inference of multiple models simultaneously. So instead of selecting a single model, you, sell, you specify all of the models, you fit them, and you base your inference proportionately on how well the different models predicted the data. Then we use base factors to quantify the evidence in favor of the presence or absence of either the effect, heterogeneity, or publication bounds. You can use prior distribution to regularize the estimate and incorporate prior knowledge and use Bayesian evidence updating uh, that's independent of the sampling plan. So in an overview, uh, the Bayesian model averaging works something like this. You have different hypotheses about the data that are represented by the different demons. And some of the and demons uh, specified hypothesis, for example, this demon says uh, the treatment works, so the alternative hypothesis is true, or there is no effect, the my hypothesis is true. And you have kind of different assumptions about heterogeneity, the fixed and random effect models, or different assumptions about the presence or absence of the publication bias. So you specify all of those different hypotheses by the different models in your ensemble. You feed the models with the data, and the models that predict the data best will grow in uh, and their voice will be heard much more. So if the model predict the data well, it uh, you will you will base the inference much more often on it and much more strongly. So uh, how we split the ensemble? Then you, for example, when obtain the model average estimate, you can look at the different components in a way that models specify our absence or presence of the effect. So you can split the prior model properties equally across the, those those two model pairs. Then against equally across models, assuming presence or absence of the heterogeneity, and then the publication does. So at the end, you end up with eight different model types that specifying all the possible complication or combinations of either the presence or absence of the effect, heterogeneity, and publication does. So each of the model or each of the model types ends up with the same prior model probability. But as I said previously, there are different ways how to adjust for publication does. So in our illustration with demon, this one demon can be represented in many ways. So what we do, well, it just circles all the way down. We just specify more models that represent this one demon. Here, you can specify, for example, the pet model as one way of adjusting for publication bias, the piece model, or different uh, weight functions. For example, one-sided uh, selection on one-sided p-values on, on the significant level, or selection on marginally significant and significant p-values on the, with the two-sided p-values and all different ways. So if you look across all of the different uh, publication best adjustment methods that we specify in robust Bayesian meta-analysis, we use the PET and PEACE uh, publica uh, publication adjustment models to adjust for the between effect size and standard errors. And we specify six different weight functions that specify different assumptions about the different uh, possible ways publication might operate on p-values. So, and all of those uh, specification cover approximately the pet piece, 3 psm 4 psm AK1, and AK2 models. So if you look back uh, to our example, we can see that in some cases, all of the methods provide still the same estimate. In other cases, uh, the ROBMA provides an estimate that's uh, somewhere between the pet piece and 3 psm and in different cases, uh, we can obtain, again, estimate that's somewhere in between, but uh, it's uh, not greater than one of those methods. That just signifies that uh, we are still doing statistics, not magic, and uh, we cannot uh, provide the best, uh, the correct answers all the time. 
And the last, uh, in simulation studies that uh, are linked at the end of the, pay, uh, of the presentation, you can see that in majority of cases, uh, the Bayesian model averaging provides uh, the best possible results. So we, to make this uh, methodology available to the practitioners, we implemented in the Roma R package. And the package uses MC estimation uh, with checks using the run checks R package, and then computes the margin like that's at a bridge sampling R package. And the most things that the Roma R package does is the model specification, some plotting summary function that I will show you in a second, and uh, additional auxiliary stuff. So the Roma R package, you can uh, use it to, to, to specify the default ensemble. You just specify the effect sizes and standard errors. So for example, here on the infamous uh, BEMS 2011 data set, you fit the model just with a single simple call and you can use a summary function to obtain some default summary of the model. Here you can see that in the first summary table you see information about the whole model ensemble and you see that you specify 36 models, 18 of which assume presence of the effect, 18 presence of the heterogeneity and 32 presence of the publication bias. The primal probabilities are equal across the component and you see the post probabilities. You can also quantify the evidence with the conclusion based factors and you see that uh, there is uh, very weak evidence for the absence of the effect, moderate evidence for the absence of the heterogeneity and strong evidence for the presence of publication bias. And then of course you see the model average estimates for the mean and uh, heterogeneity parameter and then the publication bias prob uh, relative publication bias probabilities and pattern piece estimates. So moreover, the package uh, provides additional summaries. For example, you can look at the summary of the initial models that shows you the prior distribution for the effect, heterogeneity, and publication bias, the prior model properties of each of the individual models, marginal likelihoods, posterior properties, and inclusion fa base factors for each of the models. You can also look at the MCMC diagnostics of the individual models that show a summary of uh, the MCMC error uh, minimum uh, effective sample size and maximum R head from each of the models to verify that the models were fitted properly. And you can also look at the estimates from the individual models. So here I'm just showing a print of the last two models that are specified. And you can see the model specification, the parameter estimates, and etc. So even if you don't want to do the patient model averaging and you want to look at the different at the individual models, you can look at the, uh, at the estimates from the individual models. Then uh, the uh, package also provides plotting functions. So for example, you can plot uh, the model average uh, mean estimate where the spikes correspond uh, to the probability of models assuming absence of the effect. So the effect size is zero. And then the slab corresponds to the density of models assuming uh, presence of the effect. Uh, the functions are also implemented in ggplot. So if you are uh, fans of ggplot, you can use those or you can also look at the prior and posterior distribution, for example, here for the tau estimate, assuming presence of the effect and many other combinations. Uh, the package allows multiple different specifications and uh, you can modify basically everything about the ensemble. For example, you can change the prior distribution for the effect and specify a truncated normal distribution that specifies a hypothesis of small effect sizes, that mean zero standard deviation of 0.3, uh, forced to the interval of zero to infinity, or you can specify different ways uh, of adjusting for publication bias. Here you can specify only prior distribution that specify the PET and piece uh, models that uh, adjust for publication bias. I, if you want to see more uh, different specifications and uh, customization, I would recommend to check the variants of the package that are on CRM. We also implemented the R package in JS with the graphic user interface. And uh, the JEST implementation allows you to set basically all of those customization also in JEST, specify the models with different prior distributions. And then uh, you can create different summaries for the inferences, different figures. Here you can see again, the model average mean effect size estimate and also the model average weight function estimate across all selection models. So uh, just to sum up uh, something about uh, the rules patient meta analysis, it can incorporate uncertainty about a selected model with Bayesian model averaging. So you don't have to base the inference on any single publication that's adjustment model, but on all of them and how well they predict the data. It can, we can provide evidence for either null or alternative hypothesis. 
It has better performance at small sample sizes, has the capacity to incorporate expert knowledge, and has the potential for sequential updating of evidence. On the other side, there are some disadvantages. For example, it's slow, it requires MCMC sampling, and it can also fail under strong p-hacking. So thank you for your attention. I hope you enjoyed the talk. And if you want to learn more about the package, you can also uh, can either look at the CRN where the package is released or my GitHub page where you can also submit a feature request or bug reports and uh, look at the JASP. There are some references uh, to the papers that we have written that uh, outline the methodology in more detail and tell more about the model specification or simulation studies that uh, we further conducted to verify the methodology. Thank you very much and uh, looking forward to see you in discussion. Thank you very much, Frantisek. And we will now hear from Christian Rover from the University Medical Center, uh, Göttingen. Over to you, Christian. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm going to um, introduce the new meta regression features that are now available in the base meta R package. And I'll yeah, first uh, introduce the base meta package briefly. I'll talk about uh, binary covariables and then go over to uh, different parameterizations that you can use. Uh, I'll also have an example with uh, continuous covariables and I'll briefly uh, yeah, sketch other advanced applications that you can approach. So first of all, um, just briefly, so that's the uh, base meta package as it uh, has been up to now. So it's, it implements the normal normal hierarchical model. Um, and what you assume here is that you have a number of estimates and a number, number of standard errors, yi and sigma i. And the assumption here is that they uh, yeah, are imprecise measurements and the uncertainty you have or the standard error measures the, the measurement uncertainty here. But the uh, true means here are not uh, necessarily the same. They also have this certain amount of uh, variation or heterogeneity that's quantified by this heterogeneity parameter tau and the overall mean here is mu. So in the end, we have uh, two parameters or two, two unknowns here that uh, also require prior specification if you want to use a Bayesian approach here and that's the overall mean mu and the heterogeneity tau. And that's yeah the model that has been implemented in the base meta package so far. Um, in the base meta package, uh, we are not using MCMC um, but it's, uh, yeah, the calculations are based on a trick if you want, and you get out the posterior densities and quantiles and so on um, directly without having to sample here. Yeah, now the uh, simple normal normal hierarchical model can be extended to meta regression as well. And uh, the extension is, is sketched here as well. So what we have is, again, we have uh, estimates y, i, and standard error sigma i. But uh, in addition, we also have um, co-variables or moderators or study level um, regressors here uh, that are called x, x1 to xd. Um, and the assumption or the, the model looks similar here, as you can see, uh, just in the second equation here, we see that the overall mean is not just a simple uh, uh, overall mu parameter here, but instead uh, the study specific means uh, are determined by or as, as or come about as linear combinations of these moderators here and we still have the heterogeneity parameter. And yeah, the model or the, the change in the model means that now the parameters, the open parameters that require prior specification are uh, still heterogeneity parameter tau and also the uh, regression coefficients beta, which is now uh, instead of a single overall mean is this d-dimensional vector of, uh, of regression coefficients. Calculations uh, work similarly as before, and uh, the new approach now is implemented in this BMR function here. And I go straight to an example. So the example here is, is a systematic review that was performed in um, uh, pediatric transplantation, and the endpoint here was log odds ratio of acute rejections. So that's the uh, event that you would like to prevent by the medication, and you can see we have estimates of log odds ratios here. They are all on the negative side. So the medications seem to work. And so we have six studies included here. We've got uh, six log odds ratios along with their six associated standard errors. And we can also see that um, two medications were actually used here. So there's it's two similar kinds of medications, but one is daclizumab, the other one is here basiliximab. Yeah, and if you want to account for these two 
um, medications and uh, estimate individual effects, individual treatment effects for these uh, medications. We can do that using meta regression. And what we need to do is set up this matrix or the, the, these covariables. And in this case, we can simply set up a matrix as, as we see at the bottom here. So it's uh, six rows for the six studies and then two columns for the two means that we want to estimate. And we can see that we have zeros and ones uh, encoding what treatment group or what, what medication the, each study belonged to. Yeah, now implementing that in the base meta package is pretty quick here. So first of all, we need to prepare the data, of course. So we need to derive the log odds ratios and standard errors. That's the first bit here. Um, then we, of course, need to specify the regressor matrix, the covariables here. And that's, yeah, unsurprisingly, it's, it's the matrix that we essentially saw on the previous slide. So it's uh, two columns, six rows for the six studies and yeah, two columns for the two treatments. And then the function call eventually is this <coughs> two line call here, um, supplying the effect measures here that we uh, generated in the first step, then the uh, Cover uh, the, the 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 regressor matrix the the covariables here called capital X, and we are also specifying a, a prior distribution for the heterogeneity here. If we if we omit that bit, then we would be using a, a, a uniform improper prior, which is also okay in in certain cases. And yeah, so uh, note note that we are um, running the analysis here, so we're calling the BMR function and we're assigning the results to this BMR01 object, and we can use this object later on then. So we can first of all print out the, the default output here and we can see, I mean, it's, it's a lot of text, but the important bit is if you're familiar with base meta uh, output so far, this looks similar to the previous output. Difference now is that instead of just two parameters, the overall mean and the heterogeneity, now we have in this case, um, two regression coefficients labeled basiliximab and daclizumab, and we have all the estimates and, and credible intervals and so on there. We can also go, of, of course, and, and uh, illustrate uh, the results, for example, looking at marginal posterior densities. So that's posterior density for the heterogeneity parameter. And then for the two regression coefficients that are labeled according to the uh, regressor matrix that we supplied to the function. And we can also uh, generate a forest plot. That's probably the most convenient way to, or the most familiar way uh, to uh, illustrate things. And we can see in the first plot, we, we also see the regressor matrix reappearing again. So we see the first two rows, uh, sorry, the first two columns here, um, reproducing the, um, uh, the yeah, co-variables that we supplied to the function. And we see at the bottom, the two estimates for the two uh, yeah, regression coefficients. Um, from this uh, BMR01 object, to which we yeah, assigned the output of the, of the regression analysis, we can, uh, in fact, yeah, retrieve all the posterior densities, quantiles, and so on. So we see some examples here. So we can compute the posterior 99% posterior quantile here for the heterogeneity um, by accessing this posterior quantile function here. And similarly, it works for the beta coefficients. We can compute quantiles. We can uh, compute the posterior cumulative distribution function at a certain point, say at zero. Um, and we can also compute confidence or credible intervals for, for the coefficients here. So that's again, similar to what we had before. Um, with meta regression now, it's often interesting to also infer linear combinations. So you want to have something like um, X prime beta. So a linear combination of some covariable vector X um, and then figure out what the posterior distribution of that is. And yeah, for that, we of course need to specify what our, predict, our, our, our covariables are. So one example would here be, um, for example, um, the difference between daclizumab and basiliximab treatments. So that means we're taking the difference of the two. So we multiply one by plus one and the other one by minus one, and then we sum up the two. And we can uh, yeah, implement that by supplying this covariable vector which consists of a minus one and a plus one here. And we're getting out a complex interval for that. And it works similarly. Also, we can derive predictions and we can also derive shrinkage intervals for the, for the study specific effects, these theta i parameters, which are also sometimes uh, of interest for certain applications. Yeah, so uh, we can use the same 
coding here um, uh, also for the forest plot, which is uh, often convenient. So we can, again, generate a forest plot. And if we are supplying a set of covariables here, so it's one, zero, and zero, one, and then minus one and plus one, um, three rows of covariable vector, uh, yeah, three covariable vectors, if you want, um, then uh, we can have them displayed in the forest plot as well. So we get the estimates of the two treatment effects and the difference between the two treatment effects. Um, yeah, and uh, so we can have that in the forest plot or we can also, if we're just interested in the, in the pure, in the mere figures themselves, we can also uh, use similar arguments for the summary function here. Yeah, just briefly. So we've used a particular uh, um, specification of the regressor matrix here, but there's always, I mean, there's, there's usually alternatives uh, setups that are sensible or, or conceivable. One example, for example, is what you would usually get from the model dot matrix call here, um, which would be a simple setting with a single intercept coefficient and an offset, if you want, parameter, giving the difference between daclizumab and, and basiliximab. And there's additional ways that you could uh, use uh, to, or different ways of specifying the same regression problems using different uh, regressor matrix setups, and they are sketched at the bottom here. Um, in general, they give you, or they should give you uh, consistent results. Uh, just one note of caution is that in case you are using proper priors for the regression coefficients, then the way you code the regression coefficients, of course, makes difference. But there's, I mean, there's there's a ways, or there's ways to translate prior specifications in one setting into prior specifications in a different setting. So again, you can get consistent results there. Yeah, so far I've only talked about uh, this uh, one example where we had just binary covariables. Um, I just wanted to uh, show that you can also get uh, yeah, what you might be thinking of when you're thinking of regression uh, in general. So we can also do regression analyses, including regression lines and so on. So this is one um, example application here involving 35 studies. Uh, and we have a number of covariables here, including uh, early and late onset of the treatment and then the dose of the treatment. And we can yeah, fit a model here to these 35 uh, studies, uh, including these study level covariables here. And in this case, we can fit a model using four coefficients. Uh, there's other settings uh, conceivable again. And, but in the end, we can get out these regression lines as well. So what you yeah, might be thinking of if you're thinking of regression. So in this case, it, it looks like we have an actual treatment or increasing treatment effect with increasing dose in one of the groups here and not so much of an effect in the other treatment group if in, in case of late treatment onset here. Yeah, just a little bit of an, of an outlook of other things that you uh, may be able to do. So we've seen already that uh, looking at the difference between daclizumab and basiliximab treatments that was in fact a so-called uh, indirect comparison because it was comparing treatments. I mean, the, the studies were all looking at treatment versus placebo and the treatment or the, the comparison of um, basiliximab versus daclizumab was not implemented in one of the actual studies, but still we can try and figure out uh, the difference between the two studies. So that's a so-called indirect comparison. And that means um, if we can do that, then uh, uh, I, I mean, quite generally, if you're doing meta regression, then uh, the model can be used at least to some degree for network meta-analysis as well. And I mean, the restriction here is that uh, we're looking at, oh, the data needs to be estimates of the contrast. So in, in our case, that, that was these log odds ratios. We can only handle two armed trials and we have a single common heterogeneity parameter. But I mean, at least to some extent, we can also do meta-regression, uh, network meta-analysis, sorry. Um, and finally, so um, in the output uh, from the model, we can, or the, the output also includes uh, the marginal likelihoods. And that's uh, interesting because that means as soon as we are fitting different models, we can also compute base factors, which uh, means that we can, do, we can do interesting things like model selection or variable selection or model averaging and so on if we're fitting different models here. Yeah. So, to sum up, um, yeah, the uh, meta-regression is as, as an extension from the simple meta-analysis. 
my guess is that the most popular um, practical application may in the end be looking at subgroup analysis or comparing subgroups of the studies, just like we did in the, in the first example that we were looking at. Uh, there's of course a, a wider range of applications, including continuous covariables, network meta-analysis, uh, model selection, model averaging, and so on. Um, yeah, no, a little note of caution. Again, different parameterizations um, should give you consistent results. In some cases, especially if you're looking at, or if you, if you want to use um, informative prior distributions or proper prior distributions for the uh, regression coefficients, then you need to be careful to you know, properly translate the different settings from different parameterizations. And yeah, the new base meta package version is available on CRAN since this week. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them either in the following uh, discussion or also by email. Thank you very much, Christian. I'd just like to invite our two uh, presenters today to the panel. And we also are very lucky to be joined by two special guests. So Matt Granger and Gavin Stewart will join the panel. And um, I'll open up the floor to questions from Matt and Gavin. Hello, I go hello. first, Matt? Go on then, Gav. <laughs> okay. Um, great talks, lads. Really, really enjoyed them. Thank you very much. Um, my first question is about um, the model averaging risk of bias. Um, and I thought it was an amazing package, really nice. I wondered whether or not you'd be able to extend that to nested treatments and also to think about network meta-analysis as well. So where you've got that problem that you've got the multiple, the multiple treatments and so you've got the multiple peaks and it just seemed that maybe Bayesian model averaging might be an interesting approach to look at that. I mean, people have tried doing things in net meta trying to look at all of the different treatments simultaneously in publication bias. Anyway, I just wondered what your thoughts were on those, the nesting and then the multiple treatments. Yeah, well, that's a, that's a very good question and thank you for, for the price. And uh, looking at multiple, multiple dependent outcomes uh, or different measures from the single studies is a thing that I've been working for half a year now. And uh, it's a, uh, it's a tough problem to crack, to be honest. And uh, it depends on what type of models you want to specify. If you are, uh, if you just want to uh, look at the pet piece uh, regre meta regressions that adjust for the for the relationship with standard errors, standard error squares, squared, that's quite simple because uh, you can still marginalize the stuff out or just use a multivariate normal uh, uh, distribution for dependent variables. But with the selection models, if you really want to model them properly, then you need to get a multivariate, uh, multivariate uh, weighted normal distribution. And this distribution just starts exploding and the number of computations you need to get to get all the proper probabilities. So I think I got up to like three to four outcomes from a single star study. So if you are, have the nesting and you have three estimates, that's still possible. If you go more, then you are not able to evaluate it. Uh, so I'm looking at some approximations, but nothing that I would be like really happy about yet. So yeah, but that's a great extension to, to do in the future and I'm working on. Matt. So I've got a bit more of a, a general question, really. A lot of, a lot of our audience uh, at the conference probably won't know much about Bayesian meta analysis. Um, so can you, both, both of you, maybe give us an idea of what, uh, why one would use Bayesian meta analysis over any other uh, frequencies approach? Uh, what, what do you think the advantages are? Are there any pitfalls that people need to look out for? Um, just, yeah, just give people an idea of, of why you think it's, it's a good idea or a bad idea in certain circumstances. I'll hand it to Christian, uh, Christian first. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I guess what, one uh, advantage is that um, many of these uh, of the frequentist approaches rely on uh, large sample size asymptotics, and uh, that's not the case for the Bayesian method. So they actually work well 
uh, also for small sample sizes and few studies like like the example with six studies or also three studies or two studies uh, without at least any technical problems um, yeah i mean at, of course i mean the, the, the obvious disadvantage of course is that you need to spend thought on uh, on the prior specifications that you want to use but yeah we've been also working on that and trying to uh, compile the uh, yeah obvious uh, choices there or the, the some some hints on how you can uh, start thinking about what might be sensible priors especially for this heterogeneity parameter which is not so obvious when you first think about it maybe I, yeah maybe i can yeah. build uh, upon of that <laughs> and i think the small sample sizes or like the small number of studies is the obvious problem for frequentist methods mm. and uh, as christian mentioned the bayesian methods thanks to the prior specific uh, prior distribution allow you to get the proper estimates in that regard and uh, they also, but they also offer additional uh, abilities for the meta-analysts to incorporate knowledge that's already in the literature. For example, last year we published paper in Statistics and Medicine where we described a different informed prior distribution based on the published trials in the Cochrane database of systematic reviews. So for example, for the heterogeneity parameter tau, you can get an informed prior distribution that's uh, based on the previous meta-analyses on similar topics, similar treatments, now also in GESP, we have a new module that allows you to look at different uh, different trials, combine them and get estimates from them. So you can again use this uh, previous knowledge to specify your prior distribution. The same thing then goes for the effect size parameter. Furthermore, this allows you to create uh, informed tests. So you are not testing uh, now against some unspecified alternative as you do in the frequency settings, but you can actually evaluate evidence for a point now or some perinal if you don't believe in NALS versus some informed alternative that corresponds, for example, to the typical treatment or the treatment that you would expect or treatment your founders might be interested in. And those tests then have much higher, much higher informativeness, which I think is very important for, uh, for doing statistical inference. Yeah, could, could I add to this, Matt, as well? I think that that kind of three fundamentals for me are that a lot of the time with meta-analysis, we're not actually trying to say, this is the answer, this is the effect. We're trying to express the uncertainty around it. And if you do, you do your normal meta-analysis, particularly like the lads were saying, when you've got only a few studies, that estimate of tau is sitting there in your model, pretending that you know exactly what it is. You haven't got a clue what it is. And if you put a little bit of uncertainty on that, the, the, the credible intervals just explode. So suddenly that little analysis where you've got your four studies and you think, you know, what's going on? You do it in a Bayesian framework, you can express the uncertainty much more realistically. So sometimes it helps you express uncertainty. Sometimes you get the shrinkage effects where it helps you to reduce the uncertainty by looking at the exchangeability between the studies. You now, and Christian's written a lot on that kind of stuff. You, you should probably ask him to, to chat more about that. The third kind of element of it is that it feeds into the decision models. So if you think about network meta-analysis, for example, it, there's all kinds of different ways of doing that in frequentist framework and in Bayesian frameworks, and everybody argues about it philosophically and all the rest of it, and whether or not the estimators are biased and we all have all of our technical arguments. That's kind of irrelevant to me. The, the, the reason why I like the Bayesian approach for that is that it feeds, gives me the information that as a decision maker I would want. It gives me the, the probabilities of one treatment being better or not. I can get these cumulative ranking curve for the probabilities and I can get that out of a Bayesian framework. So it feeds directly into the decision making process in a way that's much more intuitive than, than the frequentist models. So if I was just having that straightforward, should it be Bayesian or should it be fre frequentist? they would be the three things that I'd be thinking about. Fabulous. Christian, would you like to elaborate on <laughs> the second point where it was highlighted you've written about? <laughs> yeah, maybe just briefly. So, I mean, in Bayesian models in general, you've got this, this nice feature that you can um, sequentially update your information. And that's also sometimes handy in, in meta-analyses. So you can 
do a meta analysis, uh, do a meta analysis of your, I don't know, 10 previous studies, and then from that uh, derive a prior for your 11th, 11th, your future study, which is yeah, helpful sometimes, I mean, for the analysis itself or also for planning the new study and so on. So I guess that would be another advantage, yeah. And that's, yeah, goes under this term of shrinkage estimation often. And from the, also from the philosophical view, point of view, like meta analysis is not really a good way or like proper analysis in the frequentist sense because there is no sampling plan a priori. So you cannot really compute p-value because there is no sampling plan for how the studies were to be conducted in the past. So you cannot really, you don't know what's the likelihood. So you really need the likelihood based methods to evaluate the evidence properly. But uh, that's not as practical as the other advantages that we mentioned before. Frantisek, I'll just say um, we have a team chat and um, there was a lot of love for your demons. <laughs> Folks are loving your demons. It was really lovely in illustration to illustrate the point. <laughs> Any further questions from the panel? So I've got, Go I've, on, got Gavin. Another, Love yeah, I've got another question. <laughs> this one's to Christian. Um, and it's about, again, it's about kind of extensions to handling nested data and handling the multiple treatments. So I'm I'm guessing that nested data you could handle with your meta regression framework just by specifying the nesting as covariates. But, but if you move into the multi-arm NMA, you're going to have problems because of fitting the multivariate distribution. Is that, is that understanding right? You could extend it quite easily to the nesting, but doing multi-arm NMA with that, with, with phase meta is going to be really tricky. Yeah, I guess I know, know too little about the, the nesting problem particularly, but uh, I mean, the, the, uh, the computational trick Underlying the meta, the, the base meta function or the base meta package, um, in the in the simple example, it's essentially based on the fact that you only have two parameters, right? You've got the overall mean and you've got the heterogeneity, and conditioning on particular heterogeneity value, everything is normally distributed, and you can, yeah, then numerically try and marginalize over this heterogeneity parameter. And that still works also in the case of meta regression because in, instead of this single overall mean parameter that is conditionally normally distributed, you have something multivariate normally distributed, and that still works. But it's uh, so I'm not sure how you could. I'm. I guess it it would not be feasible to extend uh, the model to include additional uh, variance parameters or something. So I guess anything that's more or less a meta regression might still work, but otherwise you probably need to switch to MCMC or something. Brilliant talks, brilliant packages. So I'm gonna start using them more. Absolutely. Thank you very much, guys. <laughs> um, if we don't have any further questions, um, I'd love to round it up here. Um, no pressure. If there's any further questions, please do go ahead. Um, otherwise, um, that's it for this session. And we hope that you enjoyed it as much as we did. Um, thanks very much to Frantisek and Christian and also to Matt and Gavin for joining us for the panel. And we'll see you at the next session. <laughs>